what we know about COVID is that people turn to games for experiences and connection with people and a sense of fun and community. And it went beyond playing in a silo. It was a very experience-oriented thing. So there could be some interesting, very clever marketers that can can tap into that consumer behavior that we're seeing and probably drive some amazing marketing campaigns that could be super interesting to like tap into the moment. Welcome to Mobile Growth and Pancakes, a podcast by Stormaven. We break down how and why mobile apps grow. In each episode, we invite a mobile growth expert onto the show to break down a specific mobile growth strategy, how it worked, why it worked, and what they would do differently. I'm your host, Esther Schatz. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Mobile Growth and Pancakes. Uh, I'm your host, Jonathan Fishman. I'm VP Marketing at Stormaven, who was recently uh, recently got acquired by Zynga, which is really exciting. And I'm happy to be here today with uh, Lexi from Data AI, previously known as App Annie. Hey, Lexi. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super pumped to be here. Awesome. Lexi is the head of insights at uh, Data AI. And before I ask you to tell us a bit about your path and how you got to that uh, that position, you're kind of like known or a synonym in the industry for anything related to the mobile market. Um, I just want to ask who was Annie from App Annie and, and how she was related to apps, because I asked a ton of people and uh, folks think that Annie is the founder, uh, which is not true. And other people think <laughs> that Annie is the name of the cat of the founder. That's the, other, oh. the, the second guess. Yeah. <laughs> I wish, um, I do wish it was the name of the cat, to be honest. That is amazing. Um, so App Annie, the old name, it came from, I believe, this is before I was at the company. So this could be the stuff of legends. But what I was told was that we used to be called when we first started App Nanny. And App Nanny? Like, <laughs> like we take it, care yeah. of the app. What is cool we have here? <laughs> right so right. it was like we take care of your apps i believe so i wasn't there this is again i feel like this is folklore i've heard since being at the company but um they realized quickly so in terms of an aso um optimization tactic they realized quickly they were getting a lot of accidental nanny requests like <laughs> people thought it was like child care not app like we take care of your apps so Apparently, then they changed to App Annie. Um, and so it's more like App Analytics, kind of, App Annie. And then we had a um, kind of, not a mascot, but like a persona. Um, and initially, she, so she, her most recent rendition had like red hair and glasses and was like, I think a bit more like studious. Um, but before her first appearance, I believe, and you can probably find this on a Google search, she, um, was like Annie in the Matrix, like she was in the Matrix of Data, like suspended. And... Oh, wow. <laughs> nice, yeah. App Nanny. That was probably right. not Way not the best when. name. Um, yeah, Stormaven actually one of the first uh, name uh, name that our founders thought about was that that competed against Stormaven and lost was uh, Happy Funnel, which is also a very very bad name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I think it lived for a day before it, it got uh, thrown away. But uh, yeah, bad names are the stuff of every company that, uh, that starts their, <laughs> their journey. Cool. Yeah. So um, do you want to tell us a bit about Data AI and, and what you guys do and, and just how y- your personal path? Absolutely. So Data AI is formerly known as AppAnnie. Um, and we basically provide market data on and analytics on the mobile app ecosystem and digital space. So we're all about empowering people and businesses to kind of make better decisions to succeed on mobile. Um, And that starts with, you know, some of the the first movers in the market like gaming um, and where we still see some of the most innovation and sort of sophistication happening. But it's also um, players that are just dipping their toe in mobile for the first time from more mobile forced industries, um, even things like insurance and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we run the whole sort of gamut. We're looking at the full experience of user acquisition, you know, going overseas, entering new markets, evaluating competitors, um, all the way down through monetization. So it sort of runs all the good stuff with data. Um, and my personal story, I started in 2015, about actually about seven, uh, seven years ago. Um, and I started as an analyst on the team and have... Um, stuck around and (laughs) 
just love the data. So sort of evolved over time. And yeah, it's been really fun. It's It's been a real fun space. I'm sure you knew that though. Like so dynamic and so much is changing all the time. Um, super fascinating. Yeah, it's, de- it's definitely not boring. Like my previous job <laughs> before Stormhaven was at Ernst & Young. It was like uh, one of the big four accounting companies uh, doing stuff around international tax, like a field that hasn't changed for so, so long. And uh, it's, it's just boring anyways. Um, but uh, definitely uh, working in mobile is, is really fun and everything changed, I don't know, every year or two completely. Um, so today we want to talk a bit about the state of mobile gaming specifically as we head into 2023. Um, there were also basically a few um, public earnings reports from some of the uh, large gaming companies, not even specifically just for mobile. And everybody's talking about the same thing, a decrease in uh, in revenues, um, uh, some decrease in the number of um, active players, uh, depending how they measure that, MAUs, DAUs. Um, and we also want to talk about how that should affect game marketers or publishing teams um, in the next six to 12 months. So first of all, can can you give us a bit of an overview of where the mobile game market is in terms of like growth or the lack of growth in, in downloads and, and revenues? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we just uh, put out a report on our Q3 data recently. Um, and so we took a look at the sector, just mobile overall, uh, lots of questions about the impact of inflation and a p- potential recession on the horizon and what's going on. Um, so basically, what we saw in Q3 was actually across games and apps, um, actually, we've seen the highest level of downloads ever for a quarter. Um, I feel a little bit like a broken record because I feel like we say that a lot because it does keep kind of getting bigger and bigger. Um, but I was what we were all really curious this quarter in particular, given a lot of the market speculation um, around mobile specifically. And so actually, across iOS and Google Play, Globally, there were about 38.7 billion downloads, um, which is the biggest quarter the app stores have seen. But then when you look at games specifically, there are about 15 billion, um, which is about 37% of all downloads. And actually, we saw games were up uh, year on year 4%. So we're still seeing growth in downloads for games, which is super positive for the industry. But to your point before, we are, on the other hand, seeing a softening in spend. So in Q3, actually, consumer spend was down 9% year on year for games. Um, And I think for us, what we really look at is, you know, most of us, especially in gaming, but even as a consumer have felt this in real life, you know, COVID was a catalyst for so much of our mobile behavior and particularly for spending in games. So this softening could be a little bit of cooling off from that kind of peak time, um, but also could be an indication of um, inflation sort of finally hitting that consumer wallet uh, and affecting those sort of disposable purchases right away. Um, so it is something that we're, we're keeping keeping tabs on, but ultimately the fact that downloads are still up is super positive for us. Um, and I think going forward with the gaming industry, Mobile's still on track to be 60% of all spend in games. Uh, th- this doesn't include advertiser spend. This is just that consumer spend. Um, so that's outside of you know, PC, Mac, handheld console, home console, mobile. Mobile is still going to be essentially about 60% of that ecosystem as of the end of the year. Um, so we are still seeing strong growth. But yes, you're absolutely right. We have seen a little bit of softening and... I think there's a lot of debate around the what and the why. Um, And it could be a lot of, we did see, and we can get into some specific categories and stuff, but basically people started to prioritize getting out and about a lot more. So you started to see that in different choices on the app stores as well. You know, travel apps, travel tracking. Um, uh, We saw getting out to like in-person events and restaurants was on the rise, like sort of, you know, gigs, music venue, kind of ticketing services again, um, Airbnb, you know, people traveling a lot more. Um, And we did see, you know, that could be an indication of a little bit of that post-COVID in a sense, where all the the restrictions were a bit more relaxed. We saw that sort of post-COVID kind of burst outside (laughs) in a way. And so there might've been a little bit of softening from that with people being more out and about. But on the flip side, we still see some of the categories that are growing the fastest on mobile overall are still these 
um, social elements, these community, digital communities in a sense. And I think gaming is well positioned with how social gaming got as well during the pandemic to still maintain and tap into that thread and be more than entertainment. And it's, it, it is connection and community as well. It's not just kind of an escape or playing a game. Um, so I do think I, I'm pretty positive about that, especially within gaming, that kind of social component. Awesome. There's a few uh, questions that come to mind, but let's uh, talk a bit about the why. So one of the big questions that I see from across the industry is whether that decrease is just, as you said, uh, just a fact that 2021 was an, an unnaturally good year for mobile games uh, on the back of the COVID-induced um, growth uh, uh, era. Um, or is it, it, it actually reflects some long-term change in consumer behavior? So one really encouraging uh, uh, anecdote that we have is that the number of downloads is increasing. Um, that shows that folks still want to play games. Um, I know that you also track uh, the um, the average time spent in in apps. Maybe you do that for games as well. Uh, do you see any anything that changed, like in in the underlying dynamic uh, and the behavior of folks around the world that uh, that you know that would stop the the long term growth of games or something like that. That's a really good question. Um, so while there is, a, for consumer spend, while there is softening uh, year on year, so it was about 9% in Q3, um, we actually still see 25% growth in consumer spend from pre-COVID times, so from Q3 2019. So I think it's partly, you know, yes, there's a little bit of softening. We're not 100% sure if it's, you know, it's probably a combination of, you know, inflation for or sure. if it's a little bit of this getting out. but on the whole, it's still up. So I think that um, to your point before, I, I don't think it's necessarily a reversal. I think it's just a slight softening, but still we're on this sort of continual upward trajectory um, for gaming. I think as innovation continues in the space and more, you know, PC titles migrate or, you know, console titles migrate to mobile. I think there's a lot of space um, for this to continue to grow. And especially when you look at things like downloads, like we've already mentioned, where there is strong growth there year on year. Um, things in the hyper casual sector are also really interesting because there's a lot of um, more nuanced categories coming out. Like you can start to see some more um, game mechanics that might be in more mid core games that kind of get adopted into the hyper casual style. Um, and then it kind of creates its own little, ver like um, at our company, we'd say game IQ subgenre. We sort of have these multiple sectors. And we're seeing more of that sort of segmentation and like maturity in that area. So I feel very positive about mobile gaming is, is here to stay. And I think we got a lot of people involved for the first time during COVID who might not have ever considered themselves gamers. Um, but yes, it is an indication that there's some softening happening right now. But I don't think it's a long-term trend in my mind. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that, that, as I said, it's a combination of things and inflation has has its uh, its impact mostly on basically, you know, for it's just more expensive to buy anything else. Uh, so so there's slightly less money to uh, to spend on entertainment. Um, so there's that effect, and and there's of course the f it's mostly fear induced, but there's the expectation that we're headed into a recession. Uh, to be honest, that we don't see the, the evidence for that recession just yet. There's just a lot of expectations because we see the Federal Reserve increasing uh, their rates and not stopping. Um, and folks, um, you know, it's like the the one on one, the one on one uh, economic uh, textbook would say that that would lead into a recession. So. People are, are afraid and they're starting to cut their expenses as preparation as a preparation for that upcoming recession. And that could influence uh, a spend on entertainment as a whole. Um, but, but I agree, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's kind of a hiccup uh, and it's not an indication that anything changed in the long term growth of people consuming interactive entertainment in general. So you mentioned that. Uh, um, uh, you talked a bit about hyper casual and and categories. Uh, are there any categories that are you know booming in this time as as opposed to uh, other games that uh, suffer more? 
Yes. So um, we we recently put out a report um, that was looking at this question of like, yeah, where are the sort of winners and sort of losers right now in this climate? So we're looking, this view is looking at sort of H1, um, but from a, I can give you kind of a couple metrics. So we looked at downloads, we looked at consumer spend directly through like in-app purchases. Um, and then we looked at time spent because that helps to capture a bit as well of um, monetization that might happen outside the app stores. So for downloads, we actually see, as you might imagine, a lot of the hyper casual booming still. So actually hyper casual has been, is has hit its sort of highest levels ever um, still. So that's a huge sector of growth for games overall. Um, and we've actually seen a lot of sort of uh, older, not old, but like, you know, not brand new hyper casual doing particularly well in downloads for a long time, which is um, pretty nice to see. Because I think a year or two ago, a lot of the conversation was like, new ca- hyper casual launches, right? And it was that continual movement of that base across your portfolio. But now we're actually seeing some of these hyper casuals maintain really high active users and downloads over time. Um, full action, simulation, other hyper casual, again, there's that fragmentation appearing. Those have all seen strong, some of the strongest sort of deltas um, looking at H2 to H1. Um, for consumer spend, MOBA, um, Forex, March Battle, Open World RPG, which is really like kind of Genshin Impact, um, Merge and Match games. All of those subgenres have seen growth um, period over period. And then time spent, we see creative sandbox simulation. The big title there is Roblox, driving a lot of that. Um, simulation sports games doing particularly well for growth, 25% growth in those games period over period. And I would Watch that one as we head into World Cup season. <laughs> yes. I have the feeling we'll see some nice season out or not seasonality rather, just natural boost from, from World Cup fervor. And um, we also saw MOBA app, again, brew and time spent, word puzzle games in H1, um, with wordle sort of virality. And that kind of spilled off into sort of positive externalities for all these other word games that people started to get excited. Usually those word games perform very well in the in Western markets or in the US, and UK, and Australia. Um, but they had an extra boost this year with sort of that interest, um, that virality happening. Um, so there's some really strong sectors of growth. And then there's also some, some genres that are not, you know, that have taken a bit of that hit initially for a couple of different metrics. Got it. Yeah, I think it's also if you if you think about those those influences that we talked about, um, it's probably related also to the to monetization as well. Like if games are obviously monetized through ads, and you know, gamers or or consumers don't have the expectation they would need to pay a lot ongoingly on in-app purchases in order to progress in the game or just to even get a good game experience, um, which is kind of like people know that it's 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 in the awareness of, of pretty much all gamers that there are some games that could be free to download, of course, but uh, they would require a lot of money in order to actually progress in the game or to unlock the the really good content. So it's clear to me that games that can uh, that can provide that experience through in app advertising would attract more. Uh, more players at this time, so hyper casual is, of course, uh, the number one, the number one uh, indication of that. But other genres as well. Um, the, what do you think about that? There's, uh, do you think uh, in the next uh, year or so we would see more game developers uh, moving towards in in app advertising as opposed to in app purchases? I think that King um, recently introduced a lot of uh, in game ads. Uh, or rewarded ads uh, really recently, so so that might be an interesting move. Yeah, we actually um, we did a report I, I think around the half year point um, where we partnered with IDC and we had some survey data around sentiment towards in game ads. Um, and interestingly, a lot of users were saying, "Yep, happy to accept ads for free services, all good." Um, but also we were like pretty bullish on, but I want privacy and, and sort of that sort of thing. Um, but then we also saw that sort of um, on a lot of right areas, like you, we saw some pretty positive trends that sentiment across different ad types were performing better. So rewarded videos had rel- had strong positive sentiment overall. Playable ads still had some positive sentiment. And this is particularly around US gamers. Um, banner ads weren't super loved. 
Um, and video ads were sort of the least liked. Um, and our kind of assumption here and in digging into data is that it's likely that sort of disruption to the gameplay. You're not getting something straight from it. You know, with a, with a rewarded ad, you can kind of advance within the game still. Whereas video ads, um, it seemed a lot of, from a sentiment basis, gamers were not loving because it was a little bit more disruptive probably to the gameplay. Um, so that's super positive. We have seen um, hyper casual games, which tend, as you would know, uh, tend to monetize with in-app ads. We've actually seen those um, more hybrid models growing in those. So I think there's this still a little bit of the losing access to some data from IDFA um, and some concerns there for publishers where they're trialing, we're seeing more of that trialing out of in-app purchases in traditional ad-based games as well. So I do think that no matter like where you are in that sort of gaming place, I, I do think that there's a lot of hybrid tactics being trialed. So if you're typically more ad-based, we're seeing you know about 30% growth from the beginning of the year for hyper-casuals incorporating some form of in-app purchase. Um, and then on the flip side, seeing those that are traditionally more in-app purchase based, we are seeing there's some elements of introducing ads to kind of diversify that stream. And I think what you're saying feels correct to me in that in an economy where you're expecting to see a reduction in consumer spend, um, that it's natural to try to make that back up by introducing an alternative revenue stream like advertising. Because um, we're actually seeing time on mobile is at an all-time high. We saw two trillion hours on mo- on Android phones only um, in H1 being spent on mobile. It's up about eleven percent year on year. Really strong growth. Um, I think you alluded to sort of per day time spent, which is for most major markets sitting around like five hours a day on average per person <laughs> spending that time. On- phone. Um, so that's where, especially for something like advertising, where, you know, it's about the the eyeballs and um, the depth of time. And that's really key, I think. Um, and I also think there's this level of, and this was something we sort of touched on earlier, which, you know, pandemic kind of accelerated, but there's, um, it, there's more diversity, it seems, in games, in gamer demographics. Um, so, you know, when we were looking at some of the top charts, um, in the U.S., we saw that you know 50% of consumer spend um, in the top games sort of skewed 50% of those games for consumer spend skewed female for your top 10 in the U.S. So there's this interesting, and we're seeing more Gen X and baby boomers actually are one of the fastest growing segments for gamers in the U.S. <laughs> Gen Z is still the biggest kind of portion, but for for growth. Um, just a growth rate, we actually saw that baby boomers and Gen X are growing the fastest of all of the segments, which was super interesting because that's um, probably a little bit more positive in the sense that they control the biggest chunk of disposable wealth <laughs> or income in the US, for instance. And um, so there's a lot of, I think there's a, a lot to be said about where the gaming industry is and um, where it's positioned right now. Um, I feel overall positive. <laughs> Definitely. I, I think that, that you also touch uh, on a lot of dynamics that make uh, that make in-app ads uh, work really good in, in this upcoming, uh, I don't know, again, six to 12 months. Um, because perhaps performance marketing will take a hit. And we see that across the industry. Like QA teams are reducing uh, or shrinking their, their budgets, adjusting their profitability targets, their, their return on ad spend uh, targets, and overall spending less as a whole. We, we see that across the industry when we speak with a lot of UA teams. Um, that being said, I think that brand advertising is, is on the rise and, and mobile is the perfect channel to reach pretty much, as you said, like a very diverse group, like it's cross generation, um, very diverse demographics. So you can reach a lot of folks on mobile games uh, as a brand, not specifically just a game brand, just as, I don't know, a normal fashion brand or, or a sports brand. Uh, you, can, you can reach those folks. So I think that even though it seems that in this in the next year or so um the the cpms or the ecpms that publishers can get by uh, going to in-app ads would be uh you know decreasing pretty fast because demand for ads would go down i don't think that would be the case i think that um we 
and I'm going back to the to 2020 when COVID uh, just uh, started uh, to, to break, and and we saw and a lot of brands actually learned from that period because because some of them just cut all of all marketing costs. Uh, they fired all of their marketing team, all of their advertising teams. Airbnb was one of the the earliest uh, brands that, that did that, and everybody in the industry quickly saw that it was the wrong move. Like it it takes a lot of time to ramp up a marketing operation and a user acquisition operation. Um, and it just wasn't the right move to just stop doing marketing at this time and respond uh, like that. So I think in this rece- upcoming recession, if it actually uh, happens and it's as bad as people think, uh, we won't see brands cutting off all of their marketing and UA efforts. And I think one of the main um, um points that, that they would double down on would be brand advertising. And that's exactly what uh, Airbnb, they, they just published a report, I think, on the Wall Street Journal um, about Airbnb doubling down on brand advertising and how it uh, kind of became their leading uh, marketing spend category, uh, as opposed to performance marketing, on their case, specifically search uh, advertising. Um so I think uh, folks switching to in-app ads would enjoy uh, pretty good ECPNs uh, because of that uh, incoming demand from brand advertising. Um, what he said about rewarded videos make a ton of sense because um, in, in a time where consumers want to spend less on entertainment, but they still want to play games, and we see that from the download figures and the the time spent in apps that you mentioned, um, they ju- they're just looking for alternative and the least intrusive methods to unlock new content and get and, and play and get a good game experience without spending money. And rewarded ads uh, are the perfect example of that. That's, that's exactly the balance of the, the intrusiveness the, the users are willing to accept uh, and what kind of value they, they needs to be delivered to them um, in exchange for that for that interruption. So I think rewarded ads is, is going to be extremely strong in the next year. Um, when thinking about like what uh, what marketing teams and publishing teams need, need to do uh, in, in the next year. So I think we, we talked about, um, and that's also in the, uh, for monetization teams, um, exploring if, if they didn't explore it yet, um, moving to kind of a hybrid model of offering alternative ways to progress in the game. Uh, again, I think I saw King doing that with Candy Crush and, and they did uh, pretty well, um, which is offering uh, reward videos um, and basically balancing out their, or, or at least uh, mitigating the, the impact on LTVs because if a recession happens, of course, users pay less and, and the average revenue per, per user for in-app purchases goes down. You can make up for that through in-app ads, at least uh, uh, make up for some of it. Um, that would increase their LTV and would justify them spending more on on uh, UA and seeing uh, positive ROAS. It would increase the ROAS. Uh, that's extremely important because another thing we saw in COVID was that at these times, there's a huge opportunity for user acquisition. At a time where there's a lot of companies and and in this case, performance marketing teams reducing budgets, uh, that impacts the, the the economics of the of the advertising market. Like CPIs become, uh, I don't want to say lower because they usually don't go lower, but they're they're becoming better. And some companies really took advantage of that in the days of COVID and, and acquired tens of millions of users in, the, in that period and then engaged them in, in the following years. Uh, and I think that that would be a possibility, again, for for really smart UA uh, um, game UA companies to um, double down on, on, on that and take advantage of the lower uh, acquisition costs. Um, what what do you think in terms of like messaging? Do you think that messaging uh, marketing teams should should also shift their messaging like away from uh, or towards this game can be played like you can get a great experience for free in this game or something around those uh, those lines? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it, it's a really interesting area because I think what you're saying super super true about like there can be a really smart play in these times where. 
as you mentioned, there's some smart UA um, game companies who are sort of doubling down and doing things really well. And what we've seen is as an interesting sector, I think beyond gaming, and I think it would apply to gaming too, is this concept of like switchers. So people in this time when they're price sensitive are um, usually sort of primed from a brand advertising perspective, for instance, that they might be more willing to switch to a different service. Um, so there's this, there is this really nice time where it could mean, um, you know, targeting your competitor or, you know, even if it's a competitor game or if it's a brand advertise, wanting to advertise um, in this space, which kind of bolsters the ecosystem generally, um, that that's, switchers offer like a really unique opportunity. Um, there's also maintaining loyalty of your users and things like that. But the messaging of this, I think, is really interesting. And I think I'm really curious to see, because I think we'll start to see some of the indications of where consumers are affected with like even Netflix introducing an ad-based tier. I think that that's a really interesting one for us to keep our eyes on to see how that performs. Because um, I think that could be a really great way to see if these sort of um, reducing that consumer burden right now, if people are like, yes, I will trade off and, you know, take some ads. Um, and I think that same concept can apply to games. I also think right now there's, you know, the, the like you mentioned before, how we, there's a lot of questions about a recession, but the interesting part was that a lot of the macro data shows that consumer spending um, and jobs as well are not at least you know, as of last I looked, we're not indicating the same movement of, that's why, it, you know, part of the reason it hasn't been called a recession quite yet, right, um, is that consumer spend is still high in the market level and, you know, unemployment levels are still low. Um, so I think that this is an interesting time where we see, you know, some of the things we thought we'd expect we're not seeing. So there's the lipstick index, which is sort of where the theory goes or behind this is that, um, in times of economic downturn, when people have less money, they buy, like lipsticks have performed very well, very robust, because it's this sort of, um, the idea of a simple luxury, right? Um, and actually, what's really interesting, and I actually think, well, I think it was like during the Great Depression in the US, like baked goods were another one that was like resistant, like people wanted sugar and happiness, and that yes. was good. <laughs> Um, but now what, like they said, is that there's some indicators that are sh sort of shaking things up. Like some lipstick companies in terms of quarterly earnings and makeup companies have reported not performing as well as they thought they would have in this climate. What has performed really well, um, to bring it back to your, to your example with Airbnb is experiential companies like Airbnb travel has done well. I'm, I believe fast food, like, uh, you know, getting those I don't know, in the U S like the expensive lattes and things like the pumpkin spice latte is so big. Um, but these sort of small luxuries um, that are consumable versus like a lipstick, for instance. So I think there's a lot of, there are these sort of things that are sort of bucking trends. And it's really hard, I think, for a lot of people to, to predict how consumers are going to behave because it's so different to how in previous times these were more reliable indicators um, and I think that's why like monitoring data and, and I think that's where mobile comes in because you'll see a lot of this stuff happening at first on mobile um, as well. And I think that that's where it's really interesting for marketers um, to consider is like this messaging and in the context of what we know about consumers right now versus maybe what we thought, um, is there a way that you can make it more experiential oriented for your gaming marketing? Um, because what we know about COVID is that people turn to games for experiences and connection with people and a sense of fun and community. And it went beyond, um, you know, playing in a silo. It was a very experience oriented thing. So there could be um, some interesting, very clever marketers that can, can tap into that consumer behavior that we're seeing and probably drive some amazing marketing campaigns, whether it's branding or performance right now, that could be super, um, super interesting to like tap into the moment. Yeah, I, I think that yeah, one of the games that are uh, that are that is still doing very very well is Among Us, which was like a an amazing growth story of within COVID. It's it's a very social game. You play it with a bunch of uh, either strangers or or friends. It's, it's way more fun with friends, um, and it's still doing really really well. So I agree with you on on that um, 
experience uh, side of things. And in terms of things not happening as we as we expect them to, uh, I think it's really important to to note because kind of like reading all these earnings reports by all these game com- public game companies, you kind of get the sense that folks have already decided like there's a recession, it's happening, and they're acting on it now. Yes, there, there are a lot of actions that you can do to like kind of ensure yourself against uh, th- that happening. And there's definitely like, that annual decrease that we're seeing. But again, a big chunk of that is influenced by the fact that last year was just unnaturally high. Um, but um, I, what I don't want folks to do is to stop monitoring because if you act too soon, if you decide, right, a recession is happening, although unemployment is really low, um, consumer spend is growing across many different categories, um, th- then you just miss out. You'll miss out and and you'll act too soon. Um, and, and it's kind of like a concept, like acting from expectations that this is how the financial markets work. Like, why do we even think that a recession is happening? Because the financial market reflect or, or bake in a lot of expectations. If you look at, uh, uh, two, five and 10 year, um, us bond yields, uh, that actually reflects some of the expectations of folks of how the can, the economy would do. Uh, and if you look at them right now, it shows that uh, the consensus or the view of the market is that uh, there is definitely going to be a recession. Um, so folks are already acting as if it's happening, but but in the meantime, it could be months or or a quarter or two before anything uh, really uh, you, you really feel it. So uh, so monitoring is extremely important to not act uh, too soon and miss out on on opportunities. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, we're running a bit out of time, but uh, before we we end our, our really uh, insightful conversation, I wanted to ask you, uh, given that the name of the podcast is Mobile Growth and Pancakes, what is <laughs> your favorite pancake? Uh, I know that you live now in Australia uh, and you're American, so uh, this can go uh, multiple ways. <laughs> <laughs> My, okay, so yes, I am a big fan of pancakes for sure. Um, and I personally love um, buttermilk blueberry pancakes. And I'm I'm a little bit particular with my pa- my blueberries. I like the really small wild blueberries. So if you're in the US, that would be like Maine blueberries. Um, or there's, I'm sure, like a lot of like Scandinavian countries have those like, you know, when they grow in like cold climates and they're really small, but they're so tasty. Um, yes, those would be my favorite. I think if you had asked me when I was a teenager growing up, um, it would have been, and this probably, I don't, don't judge me. It would have been like chocolate chip pancakes with like peanut butter and syrup. <laughs> nice. nice. It tastes like a Reese's peanut butter cup for breakfast. <laughs> I still like it in, in the age of 34. Um, yeah. it's a good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When my it's daughter delicious. asked my daughter sometimes asks me to to make pancakes, and I've kind of say yes, I can make pancakes and eat. I, like I, I make it like as if she's the one uh, enjoying it. I, I enjoy yeah. it uh, even better. <laughs> um, awesome! So thank you very much, Lexi. This was very insightful, and I, I'm optimistic. I think the the long term folks would consume entertainment, consume interactive entertainment. And mobile gaming is is have many many years of growth uh, ahead of it. So uh, thanks for the conversation (laughs) and uh, making me optimistic. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) And thanks for having me. Also, what's your favorite pancake? (laughs) These days, uh, bacon and maple. Like I get to hear everybody, uh, everybody's answer to that question. But um, somebody said bacon and maple like uh, several weeks ago. And I just got into an eating frenzy of uh, bacon and maple pancakes. Um, is it bacon on the side or is, is it's, it? It's on top. You just throw it on top and pour maple on top of it. Um, yeah. Sounds great. <laughs> cool. You're the first person. You're the first person that asked me what, what kind of pancake I like. So uh, thank you. <laughs> of course. I literally, I'll send you a photo next weekend. I'll be trying it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks. And that was mobile growth and pancakes. Find out more about StoreMaven and how we can improve App Store performance, visit StoreMaven.com. And then make sure to search for Mobile Growth and Pancakes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 
in Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Stormaven, thanks for listening.